Barbara, thank you so much for being on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. One of the things that I wanted to begin with was your first memory of being interested in learning as a topic, as a subject, even at a at a meta level, when you're aware of this as being a concern and an issue and something that you could optimize? Oh, it's funny because I think there are two kinds of people who are teachers. There are people who are teachers because they really love teaching. And there are people who are teachers who really hate teaching. <laughs> They're like they're very shy about getting in front of a bunch of people, and uh, and they only do it because they feel it's so important to communicate what they're trying to communicate. And I fall more or less into the latter category. I I never envisioned myself becoming a teacher, uh, or learning about learning, or anything of that nature at all. And it wasn't until I was probably, well, gosh about five years ago, four years ago, something like that, one of my students asked me, he found out that I had been a former math flunky. I'd flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is you know, really kind of ironic since I'm now a professor of engineering. And, uh, and he asked me, how did you do it? How did you change your brain? So I wrote him a little a page of, of information about, I, you know, I, I had been a linguist in the army and I always had loved languages and that's all I thought I could ever do. And how did I gradually shift, well, not so gradually, but with a lot of work to being able to assimilate and master math and science. So I wrote him this email and then I thought, boy, you know, how did I really do that? Uh, that that's a very good question. Question And I started looking more deeply into it. And the book, A Mind for Numbers, grew out of that. I, I thought, oh, you know, that's, that's a very straightforward thing. I'll just kind of put together some uh, good insight from research and, and talk a little bit about that. And of course, it was far more intensive than I ever might have dreamed. But I, I think it was, it was just such a an interesting experience to to realize that I, I'd never really thought about learning, even though I remember when I was growing up, I was like, man, you know, isn't there an easier way to learn these things? Because I do these stupid things like reread a page over and over and over again. And then finally I'd flip the page and there the answer would be. If I just turned the page earlier, I'd kind of have figured it out. Uh, so anyway, uh, it was uh, kind of, I backed into it, I think. But I do notice that when I'm in front of my classes, I think because I'm very empathetic, I'm always looking at them and going, you know, they didn't get that. <laughs> I know they didn't get that, even though I explained it very clearly. And, uh, and so a lot of learning is just growing out of wondering about how other people learn. Mm, that's very interesting. And I think it's uh, so many people, they they wind up getting into teaching as a as an art itself by having that experience of you know a, being asked how did you learn that and f- coming from a space where they weren't masters of something first or uh, not even close to mastery but actually flunking in that area so i wonder what lessons you may give to someone in a sort of number one thing you have to realize if you're failing right now in something like math that someone struggling with could see that that turnaround perhaps in the future? Probably the biggest thing that if I had known back in the day when I was trying to retool my brain and actually learn math and science, and even before when I was just plain flunking it, the biggest thing that I could have done was to realize that it is quite all right to not understand something the first time you think, see it. And, and I always thought, I, I must be an idiot because these other people are all understanding what's going on and clearly I'm not. And so I'm just really slow. And if anything, the only reason I persevered was I, I would just kind of say, well, I don't care even if I'm really slow and it takes me more time than everybody else. I'll just try to hide that and I'll still learn it anyway. And of course, to other people, it just looked like I was really doing well. But behind it was a lot of work because uh, I'm not 
not one of those naturally gifted, really bright learners. But in the same sense, I think because of that, when I learn something, I really learn it at a very deep level. And I think it's that way for many people. They think they're not very bright, but actually the way they have to learn it, uh, because they their brains may not be like swift moving, uh, they, they can actually learn it much more deeply. Mm. I read somewhere, someone made a mathematical proposition that something like 98% of people just give up after the first resistance uh, that they come across. And so I wonder, how did you develop in yourself this stamina, or what would you call it, this ability to give yourself that permission to have it okay that you didn't get it the first time? I think what worked for me is to be successful in something that did require some learning. So uh, um, some concentrated effort, in other words. So whether that something is learning how to play a musical instrument or learning to sing or learning to play soccer or learning um, any number of different kinds of things, if you learn one thing so you are successful at it, then that gives you the impetus to think, you know, maybe if I stick with this next thing, I can be more successful. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's probably this. So for me, I joined the army and learned Russian. And so I, I just learned step by step, how do you practice and really learn a language well? And in, in doing that, it, it sort of taught me meta skills about learning. And, and that has served me in good stead in math and science. As a linguist, do you see a relationship between math and language? Oh, very much so. There's a sort of expert on experts. Uh, his name is uh, Anders Ericsson, who, who works out of Florida, and just wrote a great book called Peak on becoming an expert in, in virtually any topic. And often what you're doing when you're learning a language is you're not just memorizing a bunch of vocabulary words, although that that actually is an important part of learning a language. You are learning to think in a different way and to be able to process that information in a very different way. So you can not just spew out a bunch of vocabulary words, but you can bring out the grammatical structure and do it quickly. And that is a big part of what's going on in math and science. You're you're bringing out a new numerical structure, and you have to be able to do it fluently. Uh, if you haven't practiced enough, you have nothing to like, no patterns to pull into your working memory to make things easier. You're just doing everything de novo in your working memory, and it's too hard to do. So I, I think there are great similarities, and I think that a reason, part of the reason may be in this country, many engineers are from uh, from other countries be, be, besides the U.S. And part of that is that there's a big need for engineers and there's not enough engineers in this country. But I think part of it, too, is that those coming from outside the U.S. have also, they know how to learn because they've, they've often uh, had to learn English. And that has, I think, been a meta skill that has transferred to their ability to also uh, do well in math and science and engineering sorts of topics. Right, that's a that's a fascinating point. And I think uh, one thing that I observed when I was studying German is that the Russian learners, particularly the Russian learners, seem to get German articles a lot easier. And that seemed to have something to do with the fact, this is just my conjecture, but it seemed to have something to do with the fact that they didn't have to deal with articles. So when they came across articles, they got them the first time because it was just this sort of new sort of thing. And uh, for an English learner, where we do have articles just not of a gendered kind, you know, you, you're, the brain wants to get lazy and sort of ignore that. So we're not really thinking of it uh, in quite the same way as people who don't have articles, uh, if that if that makes sense, just as a kind of observation of, of how... Uh, learning another language can then give you a skill that can transfer over to, uh, to something else like math. 
I, I think that's a that's a very interesting point. And I think maybe related to that is when you learn something like math and well, let's say you learn like I'm studying Spanish now. I am a, a slow learner, but I'm going to be using your techniques to help speed things up. Uh, and but when you're when you're learning those kinds of things, you're working away at it and cognitively. I have a very limited working memory. What that means is that things fall out of my working memory very, very easily. But because some things fall out, other things come in. And that is correlated with perhaps why I might be considered more creative. So when people say, oh, man, I got to work so hard to keep these things in mind, what's going on? They often think, oh, I must be so kind of dumb because I, I can't, I don't have a steel trap mind like some people, but they're often more creative people. And so it's actually a, a talent that they have. And I, I try to remind myself of that when I'm, when I don't have a steel trap mind in memorizing vocabulary and so forth. What would you say is your number one technique that you go to when you really need to remember something? Trying to equate something with something extremely off color. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, if, it, if something happens to come to mind that is either just really wacky or else something that's not um, repeatable in public, in the public forum, it will stick. I mean, whether I like it or not, it'll, it'll probably stick very well. And that, indeed, the old memory experts from ancient Greece often, you know, said the said the same thing that uh, if you use unrepeatable sorts of things to help you remember things, that, that can be helpful. But just wacky images sometimes, or but my challenge, and I, if I can turn the question around to you, my challenge is I'm really slow. Let's say. I'm trying to remember the phrase, how can I put that in my mind other than repeat it a whole bunch of times and hear it? Uh, it's hard for me to come up with some kind of wacky um, sort of mnemonic that would help me more easily place it in my memory. Well, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. <laughs> um... The, uh, phrases are an interesting thing because uh, I always try to work from word and then add, add a phrase to a word. So if you had a key there, like token, for example, and you had a memory palace location where that word token was, and then you already knew conjunctions for uh, nosotros and so forth, um, then you could encode an entire phrase around that, that mnemonic for token. All right? And you could think of a number of ones and use that memory palace where you had that word to make a number of phrases with the word token, for example, or we and token. Um, so there's that option. My, I like to bulk things up. So it's never just about like one phrase, but phrases, multiple phrases for a single word, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and that's kind of related to the theory of substitution uh, in language learning. So right now I'm doing Chinese. Um, and my biggest problem with Chinese is not memorizing vocabulary, but actually reciting the tones. So I learned, uh, let's see if I can get this right, and people will listen to this and correct me, I'm sure, if, uh, if I didn't. But uh, winter, and uh, now I feel on the spot, so I'm going to try and get this. But uh, I remember it is, uh, oh, how did this go? So there's a tree, right? And the tree, qiu tian, but it should be like qiu tian. Um, the tree it has a number nine with a yo-yo that is smashing a teacup with yen that's burning inside of it. And that's not winter, that's fall. Sorry, winter is a different one. That's autumn, right? But I'm getting that mixed up because right beside that is another tree that represents winter. And then I have spring and summer. Um, and they all end with tian. Now, I have to remember that these are both, uh, almost all of these are words that have the first tone. Uh, one of them has the fourth tone and the first tone. So now I have a t frog there because I'm using the major method to remember of the tones. And I have the number nine because number nine is jiu uh, or something pronounced like that. And then, but it's actually jiu jian. 
So it's like a lot of confusing stuff. And this is my challenge as a teacher, which is one reason why it's very interesting to speak with you, because I'm always trying to think of how can I teach this stuff better? Because it's mnemonics are insane. You know, you're saying, well, there's a frog and then there's a teacup with yen burning inside of it to remind me of tian, uh, you know, and it's just, I don't know the best way to teach these crazy images to people in a way that, that uh, really makes sense when it makes sense to me. And I have a basis now to, um, to recall that again and again without any flashcards. I just have to remember that it's something like jiu tian. And then when it comes to substitution, I would, I would say to the, my speaking partner, wo shi huan jiu tian, which means I like autumn. And uh, then I want to be able to say, tomorrow I will also like autumn, right? Or t I like next week it will be winter and I will like winter and start changing the phrase so that it's today I like autumn, tomorrow I will like autumn, next week I will still like autumn or I will like winter or it will be autumn after winter. And this is sort of like the substitution thing. But if you just have that one word, then you can play with the phrases around it. And I have a park that has the four seasons. And so it's just a matter of practicing those pronunciations where I go in my mind, I see the tree, I see the images, I know some basics of phrases, and I just start drilling different phrases around that. Oh, that actually, that, that makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to incorporate that into my Spanish practice, but uh, it also relates in a way to the concept of interleaving, um, in, and this is something that's um, frequently spoken of in the context of math and science learning. And what the, the point is, for example, I teach statistics and probability, and I have my textbook, and it goes through the chapters one by one of the various aspects, and it, and it kind of builds up. But often what is in chapter four, say, is rather unrelated to chapter six and unrelated to chapter eight. And, by, and you learn everything in these little snippets. So you learn chapter four, and you could do the techniques of chapter four, and then chapter eight, and you learn those techniques and so forth. But the only time you ever see them all at one time is during the final examination. Mm. And so people really sometimes are, are say, oh, I just don't know how to do this stuff because they haven't learned how to pick out one thing as a one technique as opposed to a different technique because they're taught in different chapters. And what you're doing is you are using a commonality, a, a word or a concept, but then you're saying, oh, but you can use it this way, and this is, and then there's another way to use it, and there's, and so you're you're kind of interleaving at the same time that you're bringing everything together with a single word. I think that's really cool. A great a great approach to learning. I certainly have a lot of fun with it. And one of the questions that I had prepared to ask you relates to this which is that you talk about index cards, how to optimize the index cards process, and how that revisiting information is absolutely critical. But I'm the kind of student, and I always have been, and with language study in particular, I'm not the kind of person who's going to uh, ever use them. <laughs> like, I'm not going to use space repetition software. Um, and I think that's what has appealed to people about my books is because they I, I, they're often attractive to people who are also not ever going to use that. But knowing that they are effective. And knowing that spaced repetition that is uh, assisted by software is also effective for creating long-term memory, I wonder what other alternatives you might suggest to people uh, who also aren't going to go that route, but do need to be revisiting information. Because the example that I just gave you, the reason why that I can remember it today, Chiu uh, Tian, knowing that my pronunciation isn't perfect yet, is because I've rehearsed that in my mind several times. I just haven't done it with index cards in front of me. There's several different ways that you can approach it. Maybe a, a good way is to just use those spare moments to recall what you can uh, of whatever you're trying to work on. And that effort to recall will will actually do a good job. Whatever you can recall, that that's going to imprint that ever more deeply on your mind. 
we do want to let our minds wander some. So we don't want to use every spare second of, oh, I'm going to the bathroom now. I'll conjugate my verbs. Uh, <laughs> something like that. There, there are lots of spare moments. Like when I go for a walk, sometimes I'll, I'll practice to become more fluent at certain phrases or so I'll be walking along and of course my husband's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, but I'll, I'll, I'll just be doing something perhaps in my mind or saying it out loud. So using those kinds of moments, if it's really, really important, it, it can't hurt to take a sticky note and stick it on your mirror with whatever that phrase or whatever is going on. And I often will tell my students uh, in my face-to-face -face classes, okay, see this point right here, see this equation? This is such an important equation that you should put it on a sticky note on your mirror and, and memorize it. And, and so whenever you go in front of that mirror, see if you can remember it and then check and make sure you've got it right. Uh, so that's a good technique. Sometimes what I find annoying about flashcards is you get it in your mind faster than you can flip the flashcards. So it's just like, this is sticking. I'm trying to, it's just like, you know where you're going already. And you just want to rifle, go right through them. And of course it would be quicker to have something like Anki or something like that. But um, a lot of times I don't want to take the time to, I type it all in manually. I will do some uh, by handwriting, but I I often like uh, to have sheets of paper where I just write on one side, I'll, I'll write the words that I'm trying to remember uh, in English and on the other side uh, in Spanish or, or Russian or what have you. And just, and when I kind of get familiar with the page, I'll you know, put the page aside and I have a big collection of pages but that, that makes it really quick to go through. Uh, and often the kinds of things that you're trying to remember are related to, to one another. And you want to see the patterns for how they change. And you, it's hard to do that with flashcards. But if you write them on pages, you can see the relationships between different tenses, say, mm -hmm. um, or, or that kind of thing. So it... it it doesn't seem to me to matter so much that I mix them. I'm able to mix them up with flashcards. That's the one advantage of flashcards. But they're so much faster uh, to quickly review something. And even the act of writing it out, of course, is helpful. Well, thank you for those great thoughts on memory. That's very useful. I wanted to talk as well about a great course that you have on Coursera called Learning How to Learn. And uh, this is something people can find on Coursera. And it's a free course. Um, and I just wonder, what's the evolution of that course? How did it come into being? And what is what does it mean to learn how to learn? I, I sort of backed into doing it. Um, it's kind of funny. My husband and I were down in the basement filming the course, and we, we were just kind of going, gosh, you know, is anybody ever even going to watch this? Why are we doing this? And it was like, oh, well, we have to do this. We just have to do this. Because the it has a lot of helpful information and, and we feel it's really important. And the thing is though, uh, so now it's the most popular course in the world. It's got, uh, I had over one, it's about 1.6 million uh, enrolled students so far. And people just really love the course. They find a lot of value and it's, it's people from all walks of life. 5% of the learners have their PhDs. Um, we, we, uh, I got an uh, email from a fifth grader, about 12 years old, who says, oh, I took that course with my mother, and, you know, I never realized that professors could be so witty. <laughs> and I was like, boy, you know, if you knew how long I worked to try and be witty. <laughs> you know, uh, but... Uh, but, and then our older daughter is in med school, or was at that time in med school. And so she, uh, she was sitting in her class in med school and being taught by a um, preeminent uh, specialist in, the, in Southeast Michigan. And he suddenly, there's 70 kids in the class, 70 medical school students, and he suddenly stops the class, points right at her and says, you, you're the girl in the movie. 
broke the massive open online course. So here's this preeminent specialist taking this course on learning so that he can be a better specialist at what he's doing. But I, I think what can happen just willy nilly in any discipline is that it sort of grows this this sort of structure that's sort of haphazard. It's it uh, accrues through history. So, for example, let people now will say, "Oh man, anybody who did a course on learning that's like a no brainer. It's going to be the most popular course in the world." But I would beg to differ. Uh, if a I would I would venture to guess that if Let's say that you happen to go to a school of education and you said, you know, I want you to do a course on learning. And they would have immediately said, great, you know, teachers really need a course like that. And then you said, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want a course on learning for people in general. What you would have gotten was a course, uh, an online course that would have had two or three weeks on the history of education, uh, two or three more weeks on educational theories and then how babies learn and then maybe a little bit in the end about how uh, how people might learn a little effectively at, with maybe a lecture or two on neuroscience but that's it because it's really tough and we can't you know we can't go there well if you can see that kind of structure which is a very natural structure it would have grown because every, there's all sorts of different groups in education and they all have their, their approaches and their their desires. I teach the history of education, so you have to cover my material in, in, in your MOOC and so forth. So my co-instructor in the course Learning How to Learn is Terry Sinowski. He's the Francis Crick professor at the Salk Institute. So he's one of only 10 living human beings who's simultaneously a member of all three national academies. The approach that we took was just to upend everything, to, to say, no, wait a minute. How, let's, let's start from what do we really need to know about how our brain works, I mean, truly, from a neuroscientific perspective, in order to leverage that to learn more effectively. And we don't have to start with, and here's a neuron, and here's how your neuron works, we can take the fundamental key ideas and um, and bring those forth and explain them using metaphor uh, to so that people can easily grasp some key approaches about how their brain works, and then we can use that to build on all sorts of different aspects of what cognitive neuroscience, uh, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience are revealing about how you learn effectively, not just in the humanities and social sciences as important as those are, but also in the sciences, which uh, I think a lot of those who teach about how to learn don't have a solid, high, high caliber professional expertise in a mathematical or engineering or technical type of discipline. And so it, it's sort of like what they're teaching actually doesn't really apply to how you learn effectively in STEM disciplines, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So the way we're teaching is uh, in a way that's meant to be encompassing of all disciplines, uh, not just more uh, the uh, the soft sciences side of things, but, but everything. And I think when you look at meta-learning in that fashion, you can really enhance uh, people's understanding of their brains and their limitations and how those limitations can also simultaneously be strengths. Is there a sense that by learning something that at least on the surface seems more difficult, like engineering and science, than a liberal arts topic, is there a sense that that greater rigor makes it easier to learn in the humanities if you have learning experience and meta-learning uh, understanding from something like engineering to transfer over? Because, and the reason why I ask that is because I have a liberal arts background and I can juggle uh, continental philosophy quite well. But when I look at something like engineering and I'm now actively learning math uh, with the help of your book, uh, 
because I've been one of those people who sucked at algebra. Um, but I still look at all that stuff and I don't feel like I have those tools. But I talk to a lot of engineering and mathematical people and they're like, oh, that's what Jacques Derrida says. Well, of course, you know, like they just sort of get it. But that's stuff that I had to be trained to get. You, you know what I'm sort of saying? Is there a transferable skill from the technical sciences to liberal arts that isn't transferable the other way? I believe so, uh, but I also believe that there is important, in, in fact, vital value to the social sciences and humanities that can be lost if you solely focus on uh, technical and mathematical. So there are there are many things that that can be grasped more easily if you do have an engineering or a, a science kind of background, mathematical background. But at the same time, if you, uh, you, you got to be really careful because you don't want to say, well, yeah, you know, I can do anything because I've got this great science background. No, you can't. Uh, you you want to be uh, also keeping your feet in both worlds, I believe. I learned math and science, I started learning it when I was 26. And because I started learning it at an older age, I, I, th I feel as if I, I speak it with a bit of an accent. I'm not as fluent as some somebody who, boy, they were a, a whiz when they were kids and they always studied it. And so they became a professor of engineering and they're just naturally good at the numbers and so forth. I can be very good at them, but it, it's not like it flows quite so easily. But by the same token, I think that I often think more creatively about things because I had, I'm had i much more aware of the structure because I had to learn it as an adult. So I guess the best thing I can say is, yes, I do think math and science gives you a transferable skill that can make some things in the humanities and social sciences easier to learn, but you can get those transferable skills in math and science at any age. Um, it's, it's just that it's kind of like learning a language in that you're not just memorizing vocabulary, you're learning a new way of thinking, and it's that new way of thinking that is what provides for some of the transferable skills. I think of it in particular because I was trying to go back to school, and uh, I wanted to go into an MA program, and I have a PhD, MA in science here in Berlin, and they said, oh no, you'll have to go back and get a BA in science, <laughs> and I just kind of thought, but looking into it, you know, it, it is, I just don't have that grounding, even though I have some understanding of the concepts and so forth, but they simply won't let me in without uh, having done that groundwork first, which uh, makes sense, given what you're saying. Uh, if I can add uh, a sort of a side point, there are some programs where you can take tests and test into master's programs without having had the bachelor's degrees. And some people are using MOOCs, um, Massive Open Online Courses, to train themselves. And then they're taking these tests and going directly. So they're, they're, they're getting that undergraduate uh, degree equivalents without having to pay enormous sums of money and also giving up big parts of their life and and then just leaping right into the master's programs. I want to shift gears a little bit because one of the things that uh, I get to do in my job as a interviewer of people about learning and memory is also talk about some of their other interests that connect maybe in a different way to memory and a shared interest that we have uh, is altruism. And as I, as I shared with you, I did my PhD uh, in humanities and I wrote about friendship and had uh, something related to something you've talked about in a book called Cold Blooded Kindness. And you edited a collection um, that uh, is called Pathological Altruism. And I have some, had, had some similar ideas about how that altruism has a dark edge to it. And so I wanted to ask you a few questions about that, especially in the age of online education and so forth, where there seem to be so many people doing things altruistically. And I wonder, is there a dark... Well, first of all, what is altruism? And then we'll go from there. Oh, 
Well, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> um, I, I wrote a book many years ago uh, with the intentionally ironic title of Evil Genes, Why Rome Fell, Hitler Rose, Enron Failed, and My Sister Stole My Mother's Boyfriend. And it was about sort of why do nasty people do what they do? And uh, and it, it got great critical acclaim. I was really surprised. It, it did very well. Uh, Steven Pinker wrote a really nice blurb for it. And uh, But what came out of that was I began to realize sort of people would come up to me and they'd say, well, Hitler, uh, he may have been evil, but all Germans weren't evil. How, did, how come they all climbed on board with him? And I mean, that was a very good question. And I, I thought a lot about that and began to realize that the best way to get people on board with things is to claim you're doing something to help others. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, that's really how Hitler came to power was he, he, he'd say, when it, it's when I appeal to their best traits, that's when I've got them. And uh, so whatever political persuasion you might have, you're immediately thinking, you know, it's that other one. That's the one. They're, they're doing that. They're appealing to people's. But, but each side is actually saying the same thing. Uh, and so it's, I think it's important as critical thinkers to also step back and look at both sides, be able to do that and not look at the other side through the lens of the things that people on your side say about them. Because she's like, oh, I know all about them. I, I heard it, you know, I read these articles, but they're articles framed by people on your side. So critical thinking means um, you actually go in and look at it from other people's perspectives, from the perspective of the people of that side. I think when I try to uh, understand, you can look at all the definitions of altruism. And but when I really begin studying altruism, what I what I finally discovered is altruism is whatever you want it to be. It varies by culture. It varies by what your intentions are. It varies by, I mean, if you're a rather narcissistic individual, you will believe that whatever you're doing is altruistic. And it, it, it's by definition, if it's good for you, it's good for everybody, even if it kills millions. And so altruism is a really, it is the most dangerous. It, it's the best trait and also the worst trait of humanity because it can be so easily used to seduce us into doing really bad things. Look at all the, the, the terrorism going on now. It, it, is, it comes out of people who are at least um, uh, superficially, and I think in large part actually very much willing to give their lives because they think that they're helping some group, uh, some in-group of theirs. So it's altruism is a very, very <laughs> dangerous thing, and it's a touchy thing to talk about because among many deeply well-intentioned people, it's practically a religion. You, you never question altruism. It's like, it's like questioning the most fundamental tenet of your sacred approach to life. And so uh, people really, really get upset about that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm always just a bit wary uh, in talking about pathological altruism because the most pathologically altruistic of people are the ones who get really touchy about you ever questioning their altruism. Yeah, well, I think people are touchy. I mean, I wrote about friendship as being potentially pathological. I just called it hypothetical consent, which was a... I actually got the term from, uh, from a, a philosopher... Uh, David Benatar, but uh, I, it's not in my dissertation. So if people ever look that up and they're looking, searching for hypothetical consent, it's not there, but it's what I came to call it after my dissertation was written. But it's the idea that in friendships, we assume hypothetically that we can do certain things because that person is our friend. And because they're our friend, we can do certain things. So there's like a tautology there. And uh, so that's one of the things that got me very fascinated about what you were talking about with pathological altruism, a little bit different, but it is 
sort of this kind of thing that, as you said, a person will tend to think that whatever they're doing is altruistic because they see themselves as altruistic. And so they assume, hypothetically, the consent to act in particular ways. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you see a connection there to memory, because I see a connection to memory that is a bit vague, but it seems to me that so many people become memorable to us because of the altruistic things that they do. Um, and that seems to be a, a way that we encode ourselves on other people's minds. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that in response, how that your idea of pathological altruism touches memory, just memory as such, as a cultural phenomenon, a, a biological phenomenon, uh, a thing that happens to us and that we can do to ourselves and have done to us by others. Oh, boy, you bring up so many interesting ideas with that. One thing is, so people will often say Bill Clinton is just an extraordinary person. Uh, he's so such a people person. You immediately get this feel that he, he cares about you as an individual when you meet him. But I've known a number of people who have met or have known him. And one of the things he does that's quite remarkable is that he remembers you. So, for example, I met a docent at the uh, Clinton Library who had, five years before, um, she had met um, Bill Clinton, and her husband had been sick that day. So he wasn't able to come. But she'd met him, and then... Uh, so just uh, just recently, right right before I had met her, she had met him again. He remembered her by name, remembered her husband had been sick, asked if he was doing better. What kind of, I mean, there's this utter charm when you can remember someone's name that it, it, it like breaks through everything. And so people are charmed, I think, by Bill Clinton. And part of it is he'll walk into a room. He hasn't seen people for a year. And he'll go around and greet each person by name and shake their hand and so forth. And there's this sort of wow. And if you look at great leaders through history, uh, part of a common thread is that they had extraordinary memories. So they could remember, you know, people like Hitler had an amazing memory. He could remember all the armaments, all the names of, you know, from different divisions and so forth. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, same thing. Jimmy Carter, same thing. Ronald Reagan. Uh, having a powerful memory is a great tool to help you assume, uh, to get to leadership positions in part because people, I think... They, they really like it when you can remember their names. Uh, but of course, it has many other added values sorts of things as well. But I do think even the, the simple act of remembering a person's name is like a kindness. It's, it's as if, it, even though I think for Bill Clinton, it's easy. He, I don't, uh, there, there's some re research on memory, and some people just plain have incredible memories, and I think Bill Clinton is one of them. I don't, I don't think he has to use any kinds of the kinds of things more, more ordinary people like me often use, and um, so um, it's, it, it's kind of a, uh, an amazing thing how memory can be such a powerful tool, but. It, it, part of it is people like you because of that. But also I do think, you know, so that's the kindness of remembering their names. But like when I'm teaching a class, I take great care to memorize all my students' names. And very quickly, the class becomes like a family. And I think it's because I took the care to memorize the names. So, uh, but acts of uh, that's an act of kindness but i think other kind acts of kindness can also help people stick in your memory in a good way uh and so i i, I do think you know is that pathologically altruistic i guess it could be it, it sort of depends um on what your intentions are <laughs> uh, 
Another angle that I wanted to go through quickly with the pathological altruism is online education, uh, especially outside of the traditional university, relies so much on giving away something for free and uh, then getting building an audience and then essentially pitching somebody on a on a product and that seems to be a working model that works very well but i wonder uh are are educators in the 21st century online being in any way pathological in their altruism as you have gone through it in your studies and and other authors that you've read on it um and is there a problem in online education that you see emerging as an online educator yourself? Or uh, is it more or less a sort of safe sort of thing to do? Do people need to be worried about navigating online education in the future because of this way that, that altruism can have a pathological aspect to it? The reality is that online education, well, let's put it this way. In the 1950s, people started playing basketball better. I mean, they just did. They started playing basketball. Why did people suddenly start playing basketball better? It's because there was television. And suddenly people could actually see for themselves what the moves were that some of the top basketball teams were making. And so you're some kid at home, you can actually try it out. You're a basketball coach at a high school, you can encourage your, your, your students to, to try it out. So, so basketball, uh, television actually provided this new way of learning about a sport that really improved the sport altogether. I think that online learning is going to do the same thing. That it's, what it does is it showcases a lot of different people, some of whom do it for free, some of whom do it uh, because they, they get, might get some remuneration, some because they're arms are twisted by their universities to, to make this course because otherwise you won't get tenure or something like that. Um, it, so there's all sorts of reasons people do it, but basically what that's doing is getting out into people's eyes all sorts of different ways about how you can teach effectively. So, I mean, nobody's gonna watch a television show uh, or not a lot of people are going to watch a television show about um, in-depth physics or how to do electronic circuits or something like that. There's just not a big enough market to make um, make big television shows. And you can't be, it, they're kind of like not the same as a classroom. But a MOOC, a massive open online course, is it, it shows a teacher. It gives active learning sorts of exercises similar to that in the classroom. And you can watch some of the world's great greatest teachers, not all of them, but because it, it's it's sort of a little bit of a random funnel. Just because you might be at Princeton or Harvard or Yale teaching doesn't mean you're the best teacher for that topic. But even so, you get all these great courses and the, the really good ones sort of stand out. They get great reviews, people. And, and what that means is for us as teachers, we can go and look at these courses and we can improve our own teaching as a result. So I think online teaching is whether or not sometimes it might be just somebody doing it because they, they just feel an urge to do it. I mean, that's why I did the course in the first place, learning how to learn. I just thought, man, I'm, I just got to do this. I didn't think there would ever be any royalties or anything. I thought it was just all for free. And later on, I found out there, there are small royalties that do accrue for certificates. At the same time, though, anybody who wants to can take the complete course for free. The, the, the course is only, only if you'd like to get a certificate for the course, but you can take everything for free. So uh, it's like, it's the best of all possible worlds. I can give this material completely for free to anybody who wants it. And yet some people, because it is kind of fun to collect the certificates. I mean, I know, cause I collect some of the certificates and, and it's like, yes, I learned that subject. And you know, if I'm reading something really dry at night, I will fall asleep. <laughs> but if I'm watching a MOOC, 
it, it somehow it's like I've got a teacher, they're making it more exciting. It's really more cool. And so it's, it's just, um, I really like it. It's, uh, taking MOOCs is a lot of fun. Well, speaking of your own way of taking courses, and it's exciting to, to hear that you also take uh, MOOCs, which um, is interesting. One of the things I was curious about is where do you learn best, both when you're taking an online course and when you are learning in a more paper book bound way or for your Spanish learning or when you learned Russian, what were some of the environments that you learned best in and what characterizes them that people might be able to reproduce so they also can uh, learn better? So this actually relates to uh, my next book, which is going to be coming out in spring. It's going to be one of the lead titles from Penguin Random House. It's called Mind Shift. Um, and I'm really excited about it. And uh, they even asked me to do the audio book. So I'm going to read the audio book. For my, I, I told them, I said, you need to get somebody really good. And they said, we are going to. <laughs> they didn't tell me it was me. Uh -oh. But... One thing that people often don't understand is when you're when you're memorizing, it's often very good to have a very quiet environment. So, I mean, like if you're really doing something you totally need focus for, then a very quiet environment can be helpful. Although if you want to have a little music, it kind of depends on you. Whatever you want, if if you like having music, you can find research that says music is beneficial. If you don't like music, you can find research that says it's not. But if you're learning something that involves concepts, that, that say you're trying to learn how the, the structure of how the heart works and it pumps, you know, and the different, uh, all, all the different motions and movements that are going on with the heart, that's that's not something you can just memorize. You, you actually kind of have to think about how the parts all di connect. So it's interesting. Sometimes people in med school, they'll, they'll, they're like ace memorizers. They can wait until a few days before the exam, a day before the exam, memorize all these anatomical terms, and boom, they, they do great. And then these same students do terribly when it comes time for the cardiology exam. It's because the same techniques just don't apply. You can't just sit there and memorize parts of the heart and answer questions about how the heart actually functions. To do that kind of learning, it can often be helpful to go to an environment like a coffee shop or something where there's like a little bit of disruption here and there. Because that little bit of sound disruption actually puts you into a different mode of thinking momentarily. It, it forces you to step out and step back, use more more default mode more, more momentarily. And that that like puts you into broader connections, um, neurologically speaking. And that can help you see the bigger picture of what you're working on. So you're going back and forth between, you know, a task positive focused mode work and then stepping back into more diffuse networks and alternating between that can help you when you're learning kind of difficult, uh, more, more abstract uh, kinds of learning. Well, that's, uh, that's fascinating to think that one could have permission to work in a slightly distracting, uh, or to study in a slightly distracting environment and still, still uh, be able to learn effectively. Um, so that's a good tip. Now here's a test of my memory. I wanted to ask you uh, what's coming up next for you. And I believe you said the upcoming title of your new book is Mind Shift. Yes? Yes. 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 So <laughs> my working memory is intact, and that's uh, very exciting. Is there uh, a, a, a release date that people can look forward to? Yes. you Actually, you can go to Amazon, and you can pre-order it, which my publisher always likes. Uh, uh, it, the, the actual publication date is April 18th. Uh, 2017, and it's already it's doing really well. Uh, um, it's going to be translated into uh, simplified Chinese, so uh, it's it's already going in the translation vein. And uh, so, because of learning how to learn, I was able to travel all around the world and talk to learners and and kind of get insights 
from many different perspectives about the best aspects of learning in different parts of the world and kind of bring them together. And they're uh, uh, even at the same time that I'm talking about the science of learning and, and things like going to a coffee shop for certain types of learning. It's um, It was just marvelous fun to work on the book. And in some sense, it's sort of a sequel to uh, a mind for numbers and learning how to learn. And uh, so uh, I'm thinking that it, but it, it goes much bigger in scope. It's, it's worldwide in scope. And so I, I, don't, I think it's not very often you find a sort of a combination of travelogue with science book with just insights about the human psyche. And so I'm, I'm hoping that people might find it of interest in their own lives. Oh, well, I'm glad it's already available for pre-order. I will definitely go and check that out. And just a tip for people that uh, you can go on an Amazon author's page and be notified when new books from them come out. Uh, I just learned this myself the other day. So that's uh, something people should definitely do is go and find Barbara Oakley on Amazon and make sure you click that so you know when new books are coming out and check out MindShift. Uh, add it to your uh, collection so it just gets zipped into your Kindle device when uh, when it's available. And I'm going to go over after this interview to do that myself. Well, it, it, I have to laugh because I just followed you on Amazon. Oh, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. That, that's how I found out about it. Someone else said that they had followed me and saw a new thing that I just sort of put out uh, on a whim there. But I also want people to check out your other books uh, about pathological altruism and the material that you have there because I I personally find it super fascinating, and like I said, I sort of had a ulterior motive because I've written uh, in my dissertation on a similar topic, and I hope one day to turn that dissertation into a book as well. So I wanted to get a chance to speak with someone who's been in similar territory, and I didn't mean to cut that short, but also get back to the subject of learning. I think I could talk certainly more about that uh, on a, at a different occasion um, and hopefully have you again when uh, maybe some months after MindShift is available and people have read it to to do uh, an interview specifically about that book after I've had a chance to read it. I, I'd be absolutely delighted. And in the meantime, I, I can hardly wait. I'm, I'm going to be uh, ordering a lot of your books. <laughs> so it, it, what a treat to meet. I want to thank Barbara again so much for being on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. It was an absolute pleasure to speak with her and a treasure of ideas emerged that I know you're going to find useful. I want to encourage you to take Learning How to Learn on Coursera. It's an absolutely fantastic course and you're going to love so many amazing tips uh, how to take tests and how to focus more and or defeat procrastination and just practical techniques that you can actually use to get an advantage. And I really want to encourage you to read a mind for numbers because it's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, one of the things that was so interesting after this interview is that I've been following her advice about like when it's okay to go and uh, work in cafes as opposed to other times when it's better to work in silence. And my goodness, there is a advantage to this. So I really, really want you to give it a try because it's uh, it's it's so much fun. And there, there certainly are some background, I don't know, rhythmical cadences that are just more appropriate than silence. And I just it's fantastic. And I'd really love to hear from you if you go and experiment with that yourself. And really what I want to encourage you to do to sum up this uh, conclusion to Barbara's value that she gave to us today is to go out and try these techniques. It's so easy to come across another point about learning and so forth and then just let it drift into the wind and never actually do it. But what is so important is to try things and actually follow through and implement because, you know, the map is never the territory and we can, as educators, give you all the maps in the world, but until you actually take the map and then go out into the world with the map, then very little is going to happen other than the looking at of maps. 
but you want to go out and get that territory. You want both. And so I am really deeply grateful for Barbara and the work that she's done and that she's been able to reach so many people through learning how to learn on Coursera. So I would encourage you to get her map and go through actual territory by following what uh, is advised for you to do in that course. And you will have more memory techniques to use because they're covered in that course and you will have tips for taking tests and most importantly dealing with procrastination you'll have tools that will help you overcome that and that is one of the biggest ones we all face it and it's something that you can cope with and overcome and even turn into a tool so it all starts with getting into the territory and so really really do enjoy this course, uh, learning how to learn, and of course, reading A Mind for Numbers because it has uh, really great information, but you just want to take it and actually do something with it. And I think that uh, Barbara and I share this passion for helping people do things. And, you know, if you have ideas about how people like us can help you do more things, implement more, take those maps that we give you and get out into the territory, then by all means, please let us know. I'm always able to, uh, you can reach me always, you know, 24 seven. There's a link on the website, magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash contact. And of course you can come to this page, uh, which will be magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash Barbara dash Oakley. And that is O A K L E Barbara Oakley. And I will, she will be delighted to see the comments that you leave. And uh, I, I know that uh, uh, this is the basis for actually getting out into the territory and doing something. Because if you say, yes, that is a good idea, I'm going to go do it, you're already much more likely to follow through because you've made that intention. So please feel free to enter dialogue and, and uh, leave a comment on this post. And of course, as always, your participation and your sharing is absolutely appreciated more than I can express in words. And I'm so delighted when people go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash iTunes and leave a review or go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YouTube and get hooked up there. And uh, it's just a delight being able to grow this community and help more people take the maps and get out into the territory. And again, I want to encourage you at the risk of repetition that may induce recall, I want you to take learning how to learn on Coursera.org with Barbara Oakley and check out A Mind for Numbers and make sure that you are connected with her on Amazon by following her. There's a button there and it'll just alert you when MindShift comes out and I just can't wait to read it myself. So thank you very much as ever for listening to the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. This has been and shall remain Anthony Metivier, and until we have a chance to speak again, keep magnetic.